Okay, starting the recording too for those who aren't able to join us. So welcome back. Thank you for getting uh, your homework done so that we can go over it as a group. Would that be helpful to do, just to talk through the answers and why they are what they are? Um, you should have the correct answers if you didn't get all of them correct. And let me know if you are unclear as to why your answer was wrong or if you think there might be a bug in the answer key. As, I, as you all have learned before, I am not perfect. And occasionally I make mistakes on the answer key. So I am uh, more than happy to fix those so that it doesn't happen again. So uh, let's see here. So this was a homework designed to introduce you to linear and quadratic slopes and fixed and random effects with respect to time. And so stepping through a series of models designed to provide a baseline for those as well as uh, to judge incremental improvements to the model from adding those sorts of terms. So first section here was data description using a saturated means unstructured variance model. So this model is only possible to estimate directly when you have balanced data, but when you do, it's helpful to get this because it provides the answer key for what each of the sides of the model is going to be trying to do. Uh, the saturated means give you the means per occasion so in the description down here, for instance, mean well-being was estimated separately per occasion. So saturated means means that you have as many fixed effects as you have occasions. So it fits perfectly. And on the variance side, the variance in well-being was also estimated separately per occasion because unstructured lets each variance be whatever it wants and each covariance be whatever it wants as well. And significant mean differences were observed. Um, the F statistic here, the degrees of freedom for the numerator has to do with however many slopes it took to recreate all of the means. So the correct answer here is four because we had five occasions, which means you need four slopes and an intercept to recreate all the means. So any questions so far? Okay. So in terms of baseline models, that's the most complex model then we move to the simplest model that we will add things to in sequential fashion. So uh, empty means random intercept model. So this model says there is no change. It allows the occasions from the same person to be related and that's it. So it's the simplest model that would be possible for longitudinal data. Um, enter the average amount of well-being in the sample across months. So well-being is the outcome, months are the metric of time in this case. What is the name of the parameter that I am asking for in answering this question? What parameter in the empty means random intercept model gives you the average outcome across time? Intercept, correct, which one, fixed or random? Fixed, yeah, gotta be more specific. Fixed is the part that everybody gets. Random is everybody gets their own. So the fixed intercept is the average outcome across time. Yep, uh, more specifically in this model, it is the mean of the person means. So not the straight average because there'll be a, a differential weighting. Um, enter the estimate quantifying within person variation and well being. What am I asking for? Eagerly watching the chat window since this group doesn't want to talk. The estimate quantifying within person variation. What are we talking about here? Oh, no one's typing. But yet you all got these answers right, which means you found it on the output. So I know you know this. Residual, level one variance, E question mark, yes to all of that. The variance of the level one residual E's in the R matrix. Yes, that's the estimate quantifying within person variability at level one. That must mean that the estimate quantifying between person variation and well-being is what? Between person variation and well-being according to this model.
G matrix. That's where it lives. <laughs> Level two variance. Yes, looking for more words. Also true. Variance of the what? What's the term in the model that quantifies between person variation? Looking for the letter. Random intercept. There we go. Variance of the U0 random intercepts. Yes, they're U's in my notation because I can reliably draw U's on the board. In other people's notation, it's squiggle one, the Greek letter that I will never learn. But you'll get used to the format. Everybody puts the fixed effects first and the random effects second, so you can usually tell by the context what it must be. Um, if you're looking at an equation, the other way that you can tell is that random things should have a subscript that's a letter indicating the sampling unit that it varies randomly over, whereas fixed effects, the subscripts will all be numbers because they are constants, not variables. And in this case, I don't have to be more specific about what I mean by between person variation because this is a random intercept model. There is only one kind of between person variation according to this model, and it's in the mean over time, the end. Whereas in subsequent models, when we add more sources of between-person variation, then it's like, which one? Between-person variation and what, specifically? Okay, question? No, accidental unmuting. Maybe not accidental, just not a question. Fair enough. Oh, I had lots of questions on some of these here. so. Estimate of average correlation across months. What am I asking you for? The average correlation across months. ICC, yes. Intraclass correlation is what that's called. You can find it by taking the random intercept variance and dividing by the total. Res random intercept variance plus residual or you can find it in vcore in your SAS output, or sstat covariance comma correlation, I think in R, in, in Stata, something like that. Uh, coincidentally, or not coincidentally, the same answer for both of these, number 10 and number 13. I had a lot of questions about that one. Enter an effect size for the amount of constant person dependency. That is the intraclass correlation, my friends. That is what it also means. It is expressing the correlation of occasions from the same person, which other people might call the dependency due to persons. And an intercept is a specific form of dependency that means it is constant over time. So the constant correlation over time is the intraclass correlation. Uh, SDAT ICC in Stata now, yes. Yes, uh, that was not true up until about 2013 or something. That's a relatively newer one, but yes, you can get ICC directly out of Stata as well. And I think I have that in the handout. Okay. Taken as it is then, when ICC means between person variation, that's the same thing as effect size, equivalently. Is it, that is, what it is an effect size for how much of the data is due to between person variation. How much, of, how much of the data is because of, of the dependency of people in what is supposed to be time observations? Okay, I did know that. I just didn't know we call it effect size too, so thank you. <laughs> yep, you can, you can think of it as an effect size because it's in a standardized metric that ranges from zero to one. How much of your data is actually cross-sectional? is the interclass correlation. How much of it is due to mean differences that would have been there to begin with so how, what percent of your study is a waste of time, right? As you can think of it in terms of longitudinal, right? If your interclass correlation is say 0.85, that means 85% of the variance would have been there if you would sample people once. And you get 15% as the bonus for bothering to do the longitudinal sampling. Um, whether or not that interclass correlation is significant, there's a test statistic for that. And so that is the likelihood ratio test that you get from comparing the empty means random intercept model to an empty model that only has residual variance in it. This is the one test that shows up without asking in SAS. It's called the null model likelihood ratio test or something like that. 
It also shows up in Stata right underneath the fixed effects box. It says something about against an LR linear regression. It's the same one. In more complex models, that test is not helpful because it tests the entire G matrix at the same time, which is usually not a question. But um, in R, you can get this via RANOVA. And yeah, I'm probably sure it's R ANOVA, but it's RANOVA to me because that's what it looks like. And because we also say things like MANOVA, so it should be RANOVA. <laughs> After I use R, I feel like I've been RANOVA. How's that? <laughs> I'm here all week. I've been here all semester. And then that likelihood ratio test has a p-value that goes with it. So when you conduct a likelihood ratio test, you are taking the minus two log likelihood from the model that has fewer parameters, and you are subtracting the minus two log likelihood from the model that has more parameters. The difference in minus two log likelihood itself is the test statistic. It is treated as a chi-square where the degrees of freedom for the chi-square is the difference in the number of model parameters. Okay, questions on that section. All right, then we move on to uh, the trickier one. A series of nested models adding things in sequence to answer various questions. So a model predicting parallel linear change in well-being. So the key term there, parallel and linear. So we're adding in a fixed linear effect of time. And I know that it's fixed and not fixed and random because of the word parallel. If everybody changes the same, that is what a fixed linear effect of time does for you. So we have the minus two log likelihood there, the average rate of change per month, that's my fixed linear time slope. That's what it tells me is the change in Y for a one unit change in time. So in this context, it's per month as the unit of time. It has a standard error. It has a p-value. Um, I didn't bother to ask for the test statistic that goes with this because if you have the estimate divided by the standard error, that is your test statistic. It's a T if you use denominator degrees of freedom or it's a Z if you don't. Uh, in Stata, the default is not to, which is why you have to add the degrees of freedom options and add small to all of the commands. Then an augmented model, so the idea being adding stuff to it, not taking anything away, predicting non-parallel linear change. So how, what do I have to add to my model to get non-parallel linear change? What am I looking for? Random time, yeah. U1 in the equations, the idea that each person needs their own linear slope. So we leave in the fixed slope because the fixed slope still describes what happens on average. We add in a random slope, which allows individual specific deviations from the fixed slope. That's how each person gets their own rate of change when they put them back together. The fixed and random together create the individual time slope and enter the estimate for the amount of individual variability in change. That's going to be my random linear slope variance. So the variance across people in the random linear slopes is actually the model parameter that's been added. However, I actually added something else. In adding a random linear time slope, what else am I adding simultaneously that's not mentioned here? What goes along for the ride with it? A fixed would go along for the ride, but we already had that. Covariance, yeah, covariance of what and what. Slope and intercepts, ding, 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 very good. Each person gets their own intercept, each person gets their own slope, and because they come from the same person, we let them be related to each other. Uh, do we ever add a covariance between the E residuals and the U random effects? Do we ever do that? No. That breaks the rules. That would like cross the streams in Ghostbusters technology. You cannot do that. Like the definition of a level is that its variance components are uncorrelated with those of other levels. 
So anytime you add a random effect, it gets to have a covariance with other random effects at its level only. So if we add a random linear time slope, it also gets a covariance with the random intercept across persons. Uh, test statistic, that's our friend likelihood ratio test. So the difference in minus two log likelihood relative to the model without the random linear time slope. So the two models to be compared both have a fixed intercept, both have a fixed linear time slope. They differ in their model for the variance. The prior model only had a random intercept. The new model had a random intercept plus a random linear time slope and its covariance. So we add two parameters. So likelihood ratio test on two degrees of freedom should get us our p-value. All right, any questions up to this point? Good. Okay, is this useful? Just walk back through this again. Okay, yes, yeah, so it's easy to get overwhelmed with all the terminology and the ideas. So it's good just to, to slow it down, I think, and, and make sure that we're all uh, hanging in there. Good, okay. So then an augmented model, so adding, at this stage we're at random linear time, you are very welcome. Adding in a common, so common, that should be a keyword that indicates what kind of effect, fixed or random. Fixed, yes, everybody gets the same, common. So the idea of parallel or common or shared or any of those words map onto the idea of a fixed effect. And then the fun part, rate of change in the rate of change. What the hell is that? Quadratic. Yeah, I'm asking for acceleration or deceleration because a linear model implies constant change. I'm asking for a model that allows a change in the rate of change, which is adding a quadratic time effect. So yes, fix quadratic time added to the model for the means. So then we have an estimate for it. We've got a standard error for it. Estimate over standard error gives us a T, which gives us a p-value for whether or not it's significant. And in this combination, let me see here, actually, no, I'll, wait, I'll, I'll leave the interpretation for the last section because that's where all the, the numbers are in the same place. And then last but not least, augmented model adding individual differences in acceleration or deceleration. What am I asking for there? Individual differences is a keyword, means random, yes. Everybody gets their own. So we're asking for individually varying quadratic rates of change, which would be our friend U2. So adding to the model for the variance, we should have an amount of individual variability in quadra quadratic change, that's the random quadratic slope variance. And in adding that variance, how many covariances did I add simultaneously? this time. So I added a random quadratic variance, and that means I had to have added how many covariances with the stuff that was already there? How many random effects do I have all together? I got three all together at this point. I got an intercept, I got a linear, I got a quadratic. So if I add the quadratic, that means I added two covariances. Uh, at this point, somebody usually asks me, do I have to add the covariances? Yes, always. They come from the same person and they're dependent on where time zero is, which means they could happen to be non-significant. But if you center time elsewhere, they will become significant potentially. So yes, they stay in. The idea of saving parameters by not estimating the covariances is a bad idea. And likelihood ratio test for that on three degrees of freedom and the p-value. And so then stepping through the conclusions here. So well-being increased significantly on average by the fixed effect of time, the fixed linear effect. The addition of a random effect of time was degrees of freedom two. Indicates significant variability in linear change. Then we had a fixed quadratic model, which indicated whether the linear rate of change increased or decreased over time. And it's twice. Twice, 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 twice. So 
what you get on your output, the number that is the coefficient for the quadratic effect of time, that number that is provided to you directly is half the rate of acceleration. So you have to multiply it by two to make it how the linear change changes per unit time. Twice the quadratic is how the linear slope changes per unit time. And all of you should have come up with the random quadratic time model as your best model to carry forward. All right, any questions on that section? I think I have a question. Please, please do. Um, I, I messed up a lot on my degrees of freedom. And what I was doing was using the difference in the degrees of freedom. And that's how I entered these in, which a lot of mine ended up being wrong. But this one ended up being correct. And so I, I'm looking back at the Excel sheet where I have everything like, written out for me. And I definitely use the difference. So can, can you just tell me how, where it came from so I know like where I'm supposed to be looking. Yes, um, let yes. me get out my Excel sheet that went Thank with. Thank you. I don't know what <laughs> sure. I up on, but I know something's wrong. So one potential issue is whether it's numerator degrees of freedom or denominator. So the likelihood ratio tests, it's always numerator, meaning it has nothing to do with the number of people and everything to do with the number of parameters. F is the only one that uses both. So I have, for instance, um, this is from example six. And I have a note in here. So these are the polynomial models going from, say, fixed linear random intercept to random linear, and then going from fixed quadratic to random quadratic, which would have been the only instances in which you need a likelihood ratio test. And I have a note in here that I am including all model parameters in the count, but in REML, the only thing that really it, it counts is the variance model parameters, but so long as you hold the means model constant, you'll still come up with the same difference. So for instance, if I have a fixed linear time random intercept model, that model in total has four parameters in it. Fixed intercept, fixed linear, uh, hang on, yep, <laughs> doing the math in my head. Fixed linear intercept, fixed linear, random intercept variance, residual variance. Those are the four. If I add a random linear effect of time, I pick up two more because I pick up the random linear time slope and I pick up its covariance with the random intercept. So that's a difference of two, which would be the degrees of freedom for the likelihood ratio test. So then in this spreadsheet, I have the minus two log likelihood for each model and the degrees of freedom, and then it calculates the difference in minus two log likelihood. That's your test statistic, which is treated as a chi-square. The degrees of freedom is the difference in the model parameters, which is also calculated. And then the p-value that I got here is from a chi-dist function. And I saw, uh, Kayla, you had found a website that gives you p-values for chi-squares. That works too. So it's the same thing that um, RANOVA or ANOVA or LR test, those things do for you in the package. So does that one make sense? Yeah, thank you. I, that's where I was pulling my degrees of freedom from. Um, so I must have just messed up my degrees of freedom that I specified for the actual model from my output. So that, that's helpful for me though, because now I know, like at least my methodology was correct. It's just I pulled the wrong number from somewhere. Yeah, um, you can always count. So you, if you count up the number of fixed effects that are estimated and the number of separate uh, variances or covariances, then you'll end up with the total number of parameters that are correct. So like in these, this comparison, I have fixed quadratic random linear, which has seven parameters in it because I've added fixed quadratic time relative to this model. And then when I pick up random quadratic, I add three more because I add the random quadratic slope variance and its covariance with the two random effects that are already there. And so then that's degrees of freedom three. The one that I don't have on here is going from uh, just an empty means random intercept model and testing the interclass correlation. That would be degrees of freedom one because you're only adding a random intercept variance relative to a model without it. Okay. 
Um, does that help folks who are having issues with degrees of freedom? Middle? Okay, and then I had a question. Can we do twice the quadratic coefficient again? Certainly. Um, let's see here. I don't think the spreadsheet will help us in that cause. One second. I'm going to find all my windows here. We will get a chance to do that in the section four here. So then section four is asking you to go through your best fitting model and interpret all of the parameters. So I'm asking you for, say, the fixed intercept. So that tells us the expected well-being according to the trajectory at time zero. So on average, people are predicted to have a well-being score of 8.7. The estimate for the fixed linear slope of month, and this person's homework, it was about 0.8. So that is the instantaneous linear rate of change wherever time zero is. So in this context, because we center time such that the first occasion is time zero, that is the initial rate of change. So at that point on the curve, they're going up by uh, 0.8 well-being units per month. Then the quadratic. So this number right here, negative 0.06, that is what the output gave for the fixed quadratic coefficient. In order to talk about what that quadratic coefficient does to my linear slope over time, I have to multiply it by two. So the linear slope of 0.8, which is a positive slope, becomes positive linear paired with a negative quadratic, that is a positive slope that gets less positive as time goes by. So the slope slows down. So they're still going up, but they're going up at a slower rate. So that's a U-shaped curve that sort of looks like this. And for every additional month, so for a one unit change in time, the positive linear slope of 0.8 is going to become less positive by twice the quadratic. So the slope will be 0.8 at time zero. It will be like 0.7 at the next occasion, 0.6, roughly twice this 0.05 here. So to talk about how the quadratic slope operates on the linear slope, you have to multiply it by two. It is half the rate of acceleration or deceleration in this case. All right, Terry, did that help? Oh, sorry, I outed you. You direct messaged me. No, that's okay. Yeah, I, I think I think it did. Yeah. Okay. Um, practice determining how many parameters are in each model. Honestly, at first, just count them. Um, if you don't have the model equation in your head, you can always count the output. In uh, in R, they will be listed as as fixed effects. They're just like one for each, and then the number of variances that are being estimated. And next to the variances, I believe there are correlations given in an adjacent column. You can count each of those separately as well. So that will be how many parameters are in your model. Um, the easier way to think about it, though, is you don't necessarily need to know how many parameters are in each model. You just need to know how many you added. So if I'm going from fixed linear to random linear, I added two. It's the change in the number of parameters that matters. It doesn't matter how many you started with. It's the difference that is the test statistic degrees of freedom. Okay, I think I've caught up with those. Um, we have random intercept variance, random linear slope variance, random quadratic slope variance, and then using those to do random effects confidence intervals so that you can talk about each aspect of the growth trajectory um, in the units of growth. So the range in the intercept, people are expected to be somewhere between 3 and 15 at the first occasion, so very large intercept variance. They're expected to change per unit time at time zero, somewhere between a decrease of 1.6 and an increase of 3, and their quadratic rate of change is also predicted to be somewhat positive and some negative. So just a way of trying to convey the, the range of variability around the average effects in the units of the original variables. Um, the correlations between these things is given in G-Core, or 
S stat re level something or another. I have a version of it in Stata. It's I have a comment that says G core matrix, so you should be able to find it there. Um, estimate of predicted well being at month one. Did you have to find that or was it already provided for you? Smiles. Was it already provided for you? Is that why you're smiling? Yeah, I like it when it gives me the answer and I don't have to write any more code. That makes me happy as well. Yeah. And the reason it was provided for you is because of how you centered time. So by making month one the time zero, a lot of things pop out as specific to time zero. The intercept and the linear time slope and the random intercept variance and the random linear time slope variance are all conditional on time zero. How about the estimate of predicted well-being at month five? Pop out for you or extra code needed? Well, I did mine with extra code. I don't know if that's what I was supposed to do, but that's what I did. Um, but I, I could not figure out the total variance questions. So um, I, I couldn't find it in my output. I'm not sure if I was supposed to do that like separate, but. So in this, in R, I had directed you to use LME for this one because the variances were off just this much to make them wrong in the homework system when I did it in Elmer. And LME, I had code in, um, I can't remember if it was example six, but I know I had it in example five that allows you to build a V matrix. And that's where the total variances are, is in the combined result of level two G and level one R that gives you the V marginal covariance matrix again. So that was something you had to ask for. Um, it's something oh, that you thank can you. ask for. I'm I missed the LME part, so that's on me. I think I was so focused on the bold that I just skipped it, so sorry. <laughs> no worries. I definitely did an LME number. So yeah, predicted well-being at month five would have been an estimate statement, a LINCOM statement, you could do margins in Stata, and a contest 1D in R, or GLHT, I think. Uh, something that does a linear combination of the fixed effects. Or you could make the model do it for you. So let's think about a hack to this. There are certain situations in which you don't wanna write 8,000 estimate statements, right? Because that's no fun. What is a quick and dirty way to make it so that your model spits out things that are specific to month five instead of month one? Change the centering, ding, ding, ding. And yes, if you recenter time so that month five is your time zero, you get the right answer. It's amazing. In fact, in building your next set of examples that we're gonna start next time, I wasn't 100% certain that I had gotten my estimate statements right. It involved quadratics and I was like, do I multiply this one by two? Cause I kind of think I should, but I'm not 100% certain. So I recentered my predictors to make the model give me what the fixed effect would have been and just to make sure that I had the estimate statements right. So in life, you're not gonna have green boxes when you're doing these models, right? I know that probably scares some of you, like, but how do I know if I'm doing it right? You don't. But there are tricks like this that you can use to see whether or not your intuitions are correct. In this case, if you change the centering, then model specific terms that are at time zero will all change and you can see whether or not your code is working correctly. And then yeah, total variance at month one and month five, those come out of the V matrix. That's where those would come from. Um, you could also calculate them. I gave you the formulas by which the quadratic model does, but yet yeah, Nikki's laughing. Are you laughing at me? Yeah, she's like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not doing that. F that, no, I'm not, I'm not gonna put in a quartic formula of time, but you could, that's where they come from. And I think somewhere in one of my spreadsheets, I actually did do that, um, cause I'm crazy like that, just to make sure that my math was right. So I, I hand calculated the V matrix at various points in writing this book, just to make sure that my formulas were right. So, and no, that's the end of the story. Hmm? Go ahead. How do you know in R when you should be using Elmer mm. or not? So 
here's what I have figured out. And I have asked people who know R better than me, and I have not gotten a better answer. There is a package NLME that is the older version. And within NLME, there is a routine that is GLS and a routine that is LME. The difference between them is that GLS allows R-only models without random effects, whereas LME insists that you have at least a random intercept and it allows R correlation structures. So if you wanted to do like a random intercept in level 2G plus an AR1 residual correlation in level 1R, it would have to be done in LME. If you didn't have a random intercept, it would have to be done in GLS. So that's one set of code written by the same people. And then there's GLHT and I think EM means, and there's, there's stuff that goes with it. It's... Then there's the Elmer, which came out of LME4, written by a distinct set of people, although I think there's some overlap between them. And Elmer does not allow any kind of R matrix besides diagonal. So Elmer is less general, but is supposed to be numerically more stable, according to all of the things on the internet that I read. But turns out the internet is wrong, at least in your homework data, because what I found in each of the data sets that I have analyzed in R, either for your homework or building your examples, is that LMER would throw an error message and say that the model didn't converge and would not give me the same variance estimates as the other programs did. Whereas when I reran the model, model in LME, it said it converged and it got to the right answers. Which is why I said switch to LME for this one because you can't get the right answers without that in this particular thing. Yes, it is ridiculous. HATE! I am a hater with a capital R at the end of it. Um, so I have been very careful in building your homeworks to make sure that um, they I can get through all of them in R. And fortunately for the next two, um, I set the signal of the data to be large enough to where Elmer, Elmer was fine with it. So... Hopefully this level of confusion should not reappear. I just wonder if in the real world it's like better to use two programs and compare the outputs or no? Um, the advantage that people keep telling me about R is that it's open source and that you can see exactly how the algorithms are written. I am not a computer programmer and I am not a statistician. So me having access to the algorithms does me zero good in troubleshooting someone else's work. I don't know how to do that shit. I am a psychologist, right? There's a reason I, I self-specialized because I don't want to be a programmer. So from that perspective, yeah. I mean, ultimately R is a package written by like, you know, some people in their basements and they put it up and it has to be meet some level of quality control in terms of being able to be run on different operating systems, but there's no guarantee that the algorithms are right or that they're numerically stable. And so I think the, these ones, these packages that I'm giving you are, have been um, more tested relative to other things that I've found, so they're more trustworthy, but yeah, it makes me very uncomfortable when I can't get the same answer across programs. I don't like it, but um, I'm trying to be flexible in working with all 29 of you who are coming to us from different programs with different stats packages under your belt. Um, SPSS, by the way, throwing that into the mix, that one starts to crap out at three level models, I have found in practice. When I built the book, half of chapter 11 would not run in SPSS. It just threw up, would not converge, whereas Stata and SAS ran them just fine. So I don't think there's one universal package that's the best for everything, but I do trust the packages that we pay money for because the money is to pay programmers to make sure the shit works. Um, so that, yeah, I'm on a soapbox now. Maybe we should change the subject. Um, okay, other questions on this? No. All right. So we've been doing some review. Do you want to go through the uh, the review slides I put together? 
Would that be helpful? Maybe? Or do you want to talk about other stuff? Back when we used to teach in person, there were days where I threw my lesson plan out the window and picked up a marker because people would be asking questions. Um, I lack that kind of spontaneity, but I'm happy to answer questions about things you're thinking about as to uh, how this applies in the real world and how you would go about using these models carefully. I'm happy to talk about those things. Uh, Lexi votes for review. Another vote for review. Okay, several votes for review. We'll, we'll do that. Let me... Let's see here. This one, 7A. Can we talk more about the way to test fit in Reml for the means? Yes, we can talk about that as well. Um, I don't know if I have that in here, but when we get to that point, I can talk about it. So what I have here is kind of a flowchart of sort of step one, you're faced with a longitudinal data set for the first time, what do you do? Like, what are the checks? What are the things to look at? And homework four questions if we have time, absolutely. So I have a, a spreadsheet built up for, to get the coding right in homework four. So we can talk about that when we uh, get into here. So let me get this to be big. There we go. So this follows, I think it's an appendix in chapter six of the book. I have a flow chart sort of appendix thing that I added in there. That's where I'm pulling this from, or rather that's where this was written off of was this type of lecture. So these are the steps um, that I would recommend in terms of a flow chart for how to proceed with longitudinal models. There are the same steps that I would go through regardless of what type of change you're expecting. And then there's a divergence in terms of whether you're modeling change versus fluctuation as well. So first step, always empty means random intercept model. That's the first model that I would estimate because you want to see number one, if you have longitudinal data in the first place, because you may not. Um, so this is primarily used to calculate intraclass correlation as a descriptive step. And as a review question, then what value of intraclass correlation means game over, you do not have longitudinal data. This is a finger question. Yeah, one. Intraclass correlation runs from zero to one. It is the proportion of variance that is between persons cross sectional mean differences. So a value of one means all of your information is between persons cross sectional and you do not have longitudinal data. Anything less than one, play ball. The relative proportion of variance at each level, though, does provide you with a forecast as to which kind of predictors are going to be most useful. So if most of the variability is between persons, so if you have an intraclass correlation, say, of 0.5 or higher, that's what most would be, then the most relevant types of predictors that you would have are between person predictors. They're known as time invariant or level two predictors, things that are constant to a person. Predict why some people start out higher or lower, some people change faster or slower. Person random effect variances are predicted by person characteristics. Um, the rest of the variance that's within persons is going to need to be explained by time varying predictors, level one predictors, such as time. Time is a time varying predictor. So the only way to explain variance that's within a person are things that change within a person, meaning that they've been measured multiple times, preferably the same occasions as the outcome. Metric of time. So this is something that I've largely sidestepped up to this point, but this turns out to be a bigger deal in certain kinds of designs. I prefer greatly in most cases to just use time and study as the metric of time where zero is at the beginning, and however much time has passed, those are your occasions. Uh, this works well because it can't be wrong. It is a pure indicator of the longitudinal information that you have with respect to time. In other instances in which you have people that come into the study at different points on the time metric, a more intuitive way of clocking time would be on that metric. So for instance, if I start out with a sample of older adults, let's say that they are 50 to 70 at the beginning of the study, and I measure them for a period of 10 years. 
then I have two different kinds of variation in what I'm calling time. I have the difference in age from 50 to 70 at the beginning, and I have the difference in time as the study progresses. So if I just put in age, I'm smushing together those two different things, and so it creates a problem. Uh, the same thing happens if it's time relative to an event. So if you're studying, say, disease progression, uh, something like maybe ALS or muscular sclerosis or something to where you go, it's worse as things go on. If you have patients who have been diagnosed at different points, then you have that cross-sectional variation in where they are on the disease progression. And then if you follow them over time, you have longitudinal progression. And those are two different things also. So using time and study as what you're tracking change over is the easiest way not to screw this up. Covariates like your age at the beginning of the study, um, your time since diagnosis at the beginning of the study, grade in school at the beginning of the study, all of those things can be time invariant predictors that then predict why some people start out higher, change faster, etc. So this is chapter 10 in the book. This isn't something that we have time to get into this semester, but is something that I used to do in my advanced class with this. So any questions on what we have so far? All right, then find time zero. So just make it a thoughtful decision as to where you want time zero to be, because that's where most of your model parameters are gonna end up referring to. So if you have an intervention design, putting time zero at the beginning is a good way to verify that random assignment worked. For instance, at time zero, your groups should be the same. But if you wanna focus on group differences at the end of treatment, then maybe it makes more sense to put time zero after everything has happened, because that maybe that's a more intuitive point. If you're studying something like deviant behavior in adolescence, maybe you have uh, ages 10 to 18. If you put time zero at age 10, there's probably not gonna be very much differences between people. If you put it at 18, there's gonna be a lot more. So it's up to you where time zero is, but you want to be thoughtful about it because it's gonna save you some time down the road in terms of generating predictions for different points in time that you're interested in. Um, it doesn't technically matter from a fit or prediction standpoint where time zero is, except if it's too far away. So I have seen this happen in real data, by the way. Um, my former life as someone who was interested in cognitive aging, I worked a lot with data sets with older adults. And invariably, I would answer questions from people in our research group who forgot to center time where they were using age as time. And in a few instances, putting in age as a predictor variable then made it so the model blew up. Now, why would that happen? Let's think about what the intercept is. Intercept is the predicted value at age zero. So you're trying to generate the predicted mean for a newborn using a set of older adults. Okay, that's weird, but maybe not wrong. But in these models, not only are you generating a predicted mean, the fixed intercept, you're generating the variance around it. So the variance across newborns as one of your model parameters to be estimated using old people data blew up. So in those instances, you can cause problems by having a time zero that makes no sense. Somewhere within the span of time observed is a good idea. Next, picture time. So if your time is balanced, I would estimate a saturated means model just to get a sense of what the trajectory is that I'm gonna be fitting my fixed effects of time for. If time is not balanced, I would temporarily round it into some kind of convenient interval. So what makes sense depends on the context of the study. You might round to the nearest hour or the nearest day or the nearest month or whatever it is, but then you can make a picture. You can estimate saturated means for rounded time just to make a picture, but then you would not use that variable in any subsequent analyses. And then make a picture. So that tells you whether your trajectory is gonna be discontinuous or continuous, whether it looks bendy, whether it looks like it's changes directions or whether it's leveling off. 
and the shape is going to guide you towards a family of models that are going to be most appropriate. Um, a note about means here. So it is very common in most research studies for longitudinal data to report descriptive statistics for each occasion. So for the predictors and the outcomes, you might give a mean, a standard deviation, and the sample size at each occasion. That's okay, but that's not what's being modeled. Just reporting the mean, like running proc means or just descriptive statistics like you learned in intro stat, assumes that you have missing data that's missing completely at random. And that is probably not the case. Uh, attrition, selection, whatever mechanisms cause people to not come back or to not cooperate are probably not random processes. So the saturated means that you get out of this analysis are not going to match the ones in the original data to the extent that you have missing data with an informative pattern of missingness. So your trajectories that the saturated means model imply may not look like the means in some cases, particularly for occasions with a lot of missingness, but they are what the model fixed effects are trying to recover. So I would be very careful if you're going to report descriptive statistics to make the distinction that these are from the complete data versus these are the means that the model is trying to predict which are recovered using maximum likelihood under an assumption of missing at random, MAR, random only after controlling for the person's current occasions that they do have and any covariates. Um, this distinction, by the way, is sometimes called an, an intent to treat analysis. That terminology is used to describe that you don't just use listwise deletion and you don't just um, fill in values. So you'll read about that sometimes in longitudinal that they'll take the last variable that they do have for people who didn't come back and they'll stick it in at later occasions. Don't ever do that. Very bad idea. You can't just fill in missing data by putting a number in there and calling it good. That is totally cheating. The good news is you don't usually need to do multiple imputation though if you're using maximum likelihood. So making a picture making the means useful to get yourself started. Why would someone ever do that? Because they're using ordinary least squares that insist that you have complete data, and that's how they solve the problem. That's why. So then what about change? So there are different kinds of longitudinal studies. Some of them are designed to examine developmental processes or effects of treatments or interventions or trainings that the point of the study is to see how people change. That's one clear cut case. There's another clear cut case from the opposite perspective, what I call fluctuation designs, where the goal is just to get a lot of data per person to look at within person associations, things like stress and mood and affect and wellness and social support and all those kinds of variables they're not intervening, they're not doing anything to the person, they're just collecting this stuff as it happens. So if you have the latter, so the, uh, the left-hand side here, a pure within-person fluctuation type of model, it may be the case that you don't need any fixed effects related to time because there is no change. People are just going about their business, doesn't matter if it's time one or time two or time three, there's no systematic increase in it or decrease in anything that you're studying. And if that's the case, then testing random slopes for change over time isn't gonna help you. If people aren't changing, then adding fixed and random effects related to time aren't gonna help you. So that would be a case in which your model for the variance would probably consider some kind of alternative covariance structure. So a random intercept, usually as a sort of a starting point, and then some kind of correlation pattern in R that would allow occasions that are closer together to be more related. So one that I like is random intercept plus AR1 correlation in R because you can extend it for unbalanced data. And it's a very simple model. It's three parameters, random intercept variance, residual variance, and autocorrelation. That, that, that does a pretty good job for these sorts of designs. On the right hand side is the classic case of what you would call growth modeling, 
or what you might call latent growth modeling. Do you remember what the difference is? Are we doing growth modeling in this class? Did you just do a growth model for homework three? Yeah, did you just do a latent growth model for homework three? Yeah. According to how most people define it, you did. They just call it that if you did it in M plus or Levon instead. They're not talking about latent factors that grow over time, which would be a different set of uh, terminology. But in that case, if people are changing over time, they're changing on purpose, like in a way that you either created or is expected based on development, then you'd have fixed slopes related to time and you'd have random slopes related to time. But then there's this middle category. What are they referring to with latent? The fact that they set up their random effects as latent variables in a structural equation model. That's it. So it's just a terminology thing? Yes, it is. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> I'm glad you, I remember you talking about that, but I'm glad you said it again. Yep. Yep. If you have a, a latent factor as your outcome and you want to see that grow, then that would be called either a higher order growth model, a second order growth model. It would be a curve of factors model potentially, or a factor of curves, depending on the ordering that you put it in. So those are a whole different set of models. But yes, growth models. But then there's the middle category here. So the bottom line is that even if you don't think that time is relevant to you, double check. Because there may be effects related to time that you did not anticipate. And those effects should still be modeled in the same way as if you had anticipated them. So that's why I have these question marks here. Uh, here's a couple of examples. So back when I was teaching um, at Penn State, when I was a postdoc, I had students do projects. These are the data from one of the projects. So what you are looking at on the y-axis is intent to drink. How many drinks you plan on drinking. These are undergraduates from the psychology pool. Of course, none of them are technically old enough to drink, but that's not relevant here. They're going to do it anyway. And on the x-axis is week of their study. So they measured each person for 10 weeks and they saw the pattern of means where they were going to drink about eight drinks on average. And it's, it gradually increased throughout the semester, but then it came back down. So my student had these wave one, wave two, wave three, right in her data set. And we, I worked with her to fit this really complicated random quadratic time model because she had this trajectory, right? And then she sent me an email and she's like, oh, I figured it out. What they had with respect to the semester is a rolling cohort where there were three groups of students. So they started at week one, week two, week three. And when you align the data based on what actual week it was in the semester, not when they started, but relative to the calendar, you get this picture instead. This is standard behavior, spring break. Back to standard behavior. So you see this huge spike at spring break. So the x-axis has shifted a little over, but this is the pattern of means that this picture developed. And the only reason that it looked like there was this gradual increase and followed by a decrease is because of the, in, the rolling enrollment into the study. So yeah, they didn't think that number of drinks per week was going to be a variable that changed over time because they were measuring them throughout the semester. But it turned out that yeah, spring break mattered. So what I had suggested that she do then is to fit a growth curve model to these data, even though they're not supposed to change, but with a different form. If I have a pattern of means that looks like this, do you think a linear effect of time is gonna be effective at capturing this? Nope. How about a quadratic effect of time? Nope. How about something kind of piecewisey? Yeah, it's actually simpler than that. I told her to put in a dummy code for whether or not it was spring break. 
zero if it's not, one if it is. So if I put in a fixed effect of spring break, what am I allowing in the model? If I put in a fixed effect of this dummy code predictor where zero is regular semester and one is spring break, what am I allowing via that fixed effect? Any ideas? Remember, fixed effects are to describe the average trajectory. So these means down here. Yeah, estimating a separate mean for spring break. Yeah, the fixed effect of a dummy code for whether or not it's spring break would give me the mean difference between zero as the rest of the semester versus spring break. So how much crazier do you plan to go that week on average? It looks like people are planning to drink twice as much as they normally do, give or take. Now what if I added a random effect? Could I do that? A random effect of spring break? Well, I can do anything I want, right? But should I do that is the question. I'd say yeah. What does random mean? Everybody gets their own, right? Everybody gets Could their own? Could it be because on spring break, everyone has different plans, so it wouldn't necessarily say that I'm going to go out to Mexico and have margaritas all the time but maybe you are if you're traveling. Dang. Individual differences in how much crazier they plan to go on spring break. So there's people at the top of this curve, I think 50 must have been the highest that they allowed on the question there. There are people who plan to be drunk the entire week as near as I can tell. And then there are like, like me. Do you know what I did on spring break in college? I was this little pink line at the bottom I picked up extra shifts at my restaurant while everyone else went on spring break so that I could make money. And I didn't drink because I had no money. So a random effect of spring break would allow individual differences in how much crazier people plan to go. And it turned out that in her analysis, she found predictors of individual differences not only in students who drink more versus less relatively to other students, but also predictors that predicted who planned to go crazy and who didn't. So two people differ from each other in these two different ways. There's this uh, time effect. It's not a growth model per se, but it is still an effect of time that needs fixed and random components. Another example that I'm familiar with, um, I don't have a picture for it, but it was one of the same classes. There was a, a daily survey of life that people completed back in when there wasn't the internet and it was a phone call that you got every night. And so the people who agreed to be in this study uh, got called every night and they answered questions about their day, their stressors, their work life, their family. And the interview was set up such that there was a first question, did anything stressful happen today? And if you said yes, you had 10 minutes of follow-up questions about that. Well, by the end of the study, people figured out, nope, nope, I'm good, nothing bad happened today. Okay, bye, talk to you tomorrow. And when you look at the prevalence of stressful events, it went like this throughout the study. Because people lie. So this poor student ended up having to fit a growth model to changes in stress during the study when there shouldn't have been any, but there really was. So he had to control for change over time and stress in his observational data before he could talk about any of the things they actually cared about. Uh, one more. This is one of my favorite pictures. This is a much more complicated measurement design. Um, this is what's known as a measurement burst design. And it is this much of it right here, B1. That's the data that we've been playing with. 
six sessions over a two week period of response time. That's the example we've been working with. This is the same data set, but these are measures of negative affect. And so what makes this a burst design is that we have a two week period of measurement and then six months later, they do it again. So there's a longer time scale of every six months and then within each observation, there's six occasions. So it's called a burst of measurement. And the idea was to be able to separately identify short-term change from long-term change. And so these data, these are older adults who live in a nursing home, by the way, that's where the data were collected, showed two different trends. On average, if you look at the means given by these uh, red triangles here, people are getting grumpier as they get older. But within an occasion, we see this short-term reactivity. The later sessions within each burst have less negative affect on general relative to the first ones. And qualitative interview type feedback from the participants about why this might happen, they liked getting visitors. These are people that don't have anyone to talk to most of the time. And you know, the first day the interviewer shows up and they're kind of hesitant, but by the next day they've made them cookies and they're gonna stay and have a chat and they're gonna go through all the questions and it actually was like a little mini intervention. It didn't last. They come back later and they're unhappy again, but this is a variable about negative affect. This isn't something that's supposed to necessarily change over time, but yet we have these two distinct kinds of changes at play here. So this would require a three level model where each individual session within a burst is level one, the different bursts that are six months apart are level two, and then people are level three. So we would have two different time scales in this example. Okay. Yeah. How are we doing? Okay. So I didn't get to the, uh, the piecewise stuff, but I can do that next time. Will that make, will that be sufficient? Okay, so here's some good news for you. Uh, nothing due until next week. You have a formative assessment due next week and another homework to do the following week. So two weeks to work on the next homework, which is piecewise models. And then I went ahead and put up your last homework as well. So that is going to be covering time invariant predictors, which we will start next time most likely. So no rush on that, but I wanted to give you a sense of what still is out there. So we're into the home stretch of the semester. So I have one more formative assessment that I need to post, but I'm waiting to see how far we've gotten at that point as to what good questions would be. So uh, thumb in the middle. That means we're, eh, yeah. So, all right, questions or comments on this? All right, then we'll pick this up. I think we can call it a day for now. How's that sound? Good enough? Okay. Then office hours start now. Let me know if you need anything. Otherwise, I hope to see you Thursday. Stay safe. Stay sane. Thanks for coming. <laughs>